I thought today we would uh, just take a leisurely stroll through uh, some history on Franklin County. Hopefully some of the things that you didn't know about Franklin County, some of which I'm sure you do know, but uh, we'll just kind of amble through the history here, uh, hit, hitting bits and pieces of it, certainly not all of the history, but uh, most of this will deal with the history of Franklin County. Uh, we did go back and I thought it would be interesting for most people to know a little bit about the people themselves. Where did we come from? Uh, and where did, uh, where did we all come from? How did we start out? So I have uh, thrown that in to get started. Now, I'm sure that some people will object to the timetables that we've used uh, that uh, have been given to us by historians. Uh, it may not jive with the Bible uh, and the dates and so forth that have been proposed, particularly um, some theologians saying uh, mankind is 6,000 uh, years old or whatever, or older, and that doesn't jive with science. But um, my reason for that is that, number one, the Bible was created to save souls, not to give a timetable. And whereas son of doesn't mean one generation, it may be sons of Abraham may be generations and generations down, but still direct descendants. But you can't use that to calculate. Um, in the past, um, there was a archbishop by the name of James Usher that tried to figure this out based upon his calculations there, and uh, he lived from uh, 1581 to uh, 1656, I believe. But uh, he came up with the fact that the earth was created on Saturday, October the 27th, 4004 BC at 6 p.m. Well, those calculations, unfortunately, have kind of stuck with people over the ages. But my feeling is uh, the Bible was written to save souls, not to give us a timeline. And uh, time is immaterial to God, you know, it's everlasting. So I find consolation in Acts 17, 26 to 28. And in this, He says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men should seek him out and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. And as far as I'm concerned, we've never found anything that God hadn't made. So we're going to amble through a long, long history from two million years ago to the present. And um, I hope you will enjoy it. We'll do the best we can. Uh, some elements of history of Franklin County. Uh, but we're going back uh, to the origins of mankind here for just a little bit. This is to digress a little bit because I think it makes things more interesting if we talk about where man really came from and how he came, to, uh, came into its being. Uh, so I hope you will find that a bit interesting. Um, here we have a, um, a very early tool, man's first tool. And bet you didn't know that man has been around for about two million years. As a matter of fact, uh, everybody started in Africa. And then there were uh, tours coming out of Africa, and many of these did not uh, persist, and probably due to environmental changes. 
And the same thing happened with um, this Homo erectus, which was a man of about two million years ago. Uh, he came out and went to Europe by 1.2 million years ago, but with uh, climate changes, he didn't persist. So then we come up to the, uh, the second stage, um, and this would be the Homo heidelbergenic. Heidelberg uh, Genesis was a uh, group that um, originated very, very early, uh, and they did the same thing. They came out of Africa and came into Europe and Asia. Uh, there were two groups of this. The Denovenison group went to Southeast Asia. The Neanderthal went to uh, Europe and Northern Europe. And they persisted for uh, about um, 600,000 years. The Neanderthal man disappeared for some reason about 25,000 years ago. But these were early men, and in England, there are a couple of sites that are well known. The Foxglove site of 500,000 years ago, the um, Swanscombe site of about um, 400,000 years ago. Uh, and these are documented sites where early men had made it in. But again, they didn't persist. They disappeared. So then it was left to the Homo sapiens. And the Homo sapiens are the smart people, or the smart ones. And from that, we derive our origins. Now, they too came out of Africa. And they came out, and the traditional way of coming out was to go through the Levant, or the biblical lands, Turkey, Iran, Israel. They came out by that area there and then spread up towards Europe. And the Homo sapiens did that and 125,000 uh, years ago, but they didn't survive either. And it wasn't until about 60,000 years ago that Homo sapiens tried again coming out of Africa and this time they did succeed. And um, so we can see with the early man here, he was devising a tool. Uh, he chipped off a creek rock with a uh, small chip, given a sharp edge. And with that, he could chop out the, um, uh, from that he could chop out the meat off of the, um, large rhinoceros that they killed here, uh, the woolly mammoth or whatever, but just getting a sharp edge to use to chop meat off. Now, these early people came out and they originated in East Africa here. And again, the successful ones came up to the Levant, uh, the um, Holy Land area, came on up and then 40,000 years ago, they came over to Europe, to England, where we talked about, and the human remains have been found 45,000 years ago in Italy and in Britain. At the same time, you had 40,000 years ago, a offspring that went over to Europe, Northern Europe, and then to Siberia. And from that, we talk about how did the Indians get to America? Well, it was this migration to Siberia, and from Siberia, they came across the Bering Straits because there was a land bridge. The last of the Ice Age, about um, oh, 23,000 years ago, had disappeared. At that time, so much of the top of the world was covered in ice, so much so that the ocean level was 300 feet lower than where it is now. There was actually a land bridge across the Bering Straits. So this is what we thought that they had come across, came here, and then across North America and on down to South America. Well, uh, these Homo sapiens, like I said, were supposedly the smart man. Interesting thing is that uh, they had a smaller brain than the Neanderthal. 
they were smaller in stature than Neanderthal. But yet, uh, for some reason, they did outdo the Neanderthal, whether they killed them off or whatever happened, the Neanderthal disappeared about 25,000 years ago. It's interesting, we didn't think that there was any mixture of the cultures, but DNA analysis now shows that for most Europeans, we have 2% Neanderthal DNA. Uh, there's none in Africa, but uh, the more you go up into Siberia and in that region, the higher the amount of DNA. Well, this was, um, this was one of the things that uh, we had thought early on that what happened was there was a migration across there. These people came down and uh, then they spread out to the East Coast. And this all fit very well with the fact that in Clovis, New Mexico, many years ago, they found a remains of an Indian village that made a peculiar type projectile point or spear point that had a flute in it or a thinning in the center, which allowed more bleeding and uh, was a more effective weapon. Well, that's fine, but here are Clovis points found on the Pig River in Franklin County, Virginia. Uh, now, these are traditionally dated 12,000 years ago. So we were thinking then, aha, this all hooks up, but uh, this is a short trip across the U.S. here to get to the East Coast. Well, we know that there were more recent cultures that were different. However, bet you didn't know that in Sussex County, Virginia, uh, the Cactus Hill site has pre-Clovis points dating 20,000 years ago. Now this really upset the apple cart, and we still don't know uh, exactly where people came from, how they got here. This has brought up ideas that maybe uh, there was a transatlantic um, crossing somewhere in the northern part um, beside the glaciers, um, and if so, those village sites would probably be down underneath the ocean now with 300 feet higher now than it was then. Um, so we're really um, at a loss to know and to understand exactly uh, where we came from. And in addition now, and this was one of the very earliest uh, sites in America found here in Virginia and documented at uh, 20,000 years ago. They have found one in Pennsylvania. There's also been one found in South America. So we really don't know, but we do know early man was here, and we know they were in Virginia 20,000 years ago. Well then, the, this is the meat. This is what they were eating. This is what they were hunting for. The woolly mammoth or mastodon was here. Um, bet you didn't know we had elephant-sized creatures around here. They have found these in the salt marshes out uh, at Saltville, Virginia. You can see the size differential. And so these were the original big game hunters here. Uh, had to be very brave, but they would then, once they put this down, use those choppers that we talked about to get their meat off and this is what they hunted, was the big game of the time. Well, since then, uh, Indians are kind of like we are with automobiles. They changed their style of projectile points. Here at the bottom, you see this um, paleo point that we talked about that's 12,000 years old. And then you get up to Palmas, and that's 8,000 years old, and the style changed at the back of them so that um, you can kind of gauge the age with what you find here in the fields. But most of the finds here in Franklin County are what we call archaic points, and they date from the 8,000 up to about 2,000. There was a cultural change here at about 1000 BC. 
they developed agriculture with um, raisin beans and squash and pumpkins and things like and corn. Uh, and they did that in the bottom land. And so they had to be, um, uh, they had to stay at one place longer and didn't move about as much as the hunters and gatherers uh, prior to them did. And about the same time they developed the bow and arrow. Here they had only spears, here they had a spear thrower, a short spear with a longer pole in their hands to give them an extended arm length which made the spear thrower much more powerful. But here we developed the bow and arrow and we went to triangular projectile points and the last projectile points of the Indians prior to leaving here were these triangular points and the later the smaller they became. Well, the Indian villages tried to protect themselves uh, because there was a main um, uh, highway north and south from New York to Augusta, Georgia, and the Indian is great Indian warpath. Uh, and on 20 miles either side of that, they would make war on Indians and collect scalps. And the New York Indians were going to uh, South Carolina in order to uh, collect scalps. And along the way, they'd love to pick up some. So that suppression by the Iroquois Indians on the local Indians caused a real problem. So by uh, so we did have Indians here, um, but they left here about 1680 to 1700. Now here is a fish dam. When you come down Blackwater Hill and cross the Blackwater River Bridge just north of Rocky Mount. If you look right over the bridge, you'll see this V-shaped fish dam. It was actually mentioned in the 1788 Hambrick deed uh, here as a landmark. But what the Indians would do, they would put a V-shaped uh, dam here, send the Indians upstairs, upstream uh, to chomp down the river. They would place a basket here and then drive those fish in the basket, take it home and have a fish fry for the village. And that still persists to today and is very visible. You can see it. Um, over at Wirtz, uh, this was plowed up many years ago, probably a ceremonial Indian ax. Um, it's very, very large, as you can see by the size of the quarter there, that um, this is very large and probably was more of a ceremonial piece than an actual piece that was used. Well, I don't know if you've seen anybody that looks like this, but probably this is the original Indian statuary. Um, you can't really see it, but there are little marks right here, streaks, uh, V-shaped streaks. Uh, and we think this is truly an Indian piece that was uh, found in the woods down around Jack's Mountain uh, in the Glade Hill area many years ago. Uh, but that's just evident that the Indians were here. Well, uh, what they did, uh, they disappeared about 1680 uh, to 1700. They were all gone. Now, this is the view that Batson Fallum Expedition had. That came out of, we, out of, Jan out of um, Petersburg and came up looking for the western waters. In, six, in September the 6th, 1671, they first saw the mountains, and it is believed this is in the Burnt Chimney area of Franklin County that Batson Fallum expedition first saw the mountains. And they proceeded on and went up to the Totara Indian village uh, which was probably anywhere from Salem to Christiansburg, and then went on to find the new river flowing westward, and that was a new direction, so they named it New River because it empties into the Mississippi, not the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, these were the early explorers. Well, at the time they were here, William Byrd was already here dealing with the Indians in 1671. That's William Byrd that established Richmond. And his son was also involved in the westward expeditions uh, as well. Well, 
These Indians were local Indians. They were Siouan Indians. And you think of Sioux Indians as being those of buffalo hunters. But they originated in the Ohio Valley. Some came east as eastern Sioux. Some went west. And here we had, we mentioned the Totoro Village. Um, the uh, Sapone River was the Roanoke River, originally named. And uh, the Sapone's uh, main headquarters was down around Charlotte Courthouse on the Roanoke River or the Stanton River, as it's called. Um, but they were here. Uh, and then we had the Monacan Indians that were up around Amherst. And the Monacan Indians probably was an assemblage of Siouan tribe. The Tuscarora Indians of North Carolina were defeated by the North Carolinians in 1712. And um, some of those escaped and came up and apparently were assimilated into the Monacan tribe. As a matter of fact, we have a uh, 1755 map that has Monacan or Tuscarora in the Amherst area uh, as labeled. Now, tradition is that many of them finally went back to the North Carolina area but they were, they all assimilated into Siouan tribes at that time. These tribes of Siouan Indians, um, because of the pressure, they went deeper south. They went to the Yadkin uh, in North Carolina by 1701. By 1712, they tried coming north again to Fort Christiana that Governor Spotswood had built a fort to protect them down in Brunswick County, but they couldn't protect them. Still, there was effort by the Iroquois uh, to collect scalps, and they did, right outside the fort. So um, if you can't lick them, join them, they all migrated up to join the Iroquois in the 1740s in Pennsylvania and New York, and eventually settled in New York and southern Canada uh, and became part of the Six Nation of the Iroquois. And that's what happened to our local Indians. The last to uh, full-blooded um, uh, Indian was, 16, uh, was um, uh, 17, uh, um, I believe 1871, uh, when the last full-blooded Indians of the Tutelo died, and the last to speak the language was the 1880s. Well, we didn't have a great deal of problems here until uh, the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War, the French had instigated the Indians in um, the Ohio Valley, and they came across the mountains to Virginia, again, creating real problems. And we had some local problems here. Um, in 1757, we had trouble with the Cherokees that were supposed to be our friends. You see, Virginia decided this would be a good move to recruit the Cherokees to fight the Iroquois, who were their enemies. Um, and so uh, they got a bunch of Cherokees to go up, and they promised them rewards. But, of course, the Indians wanted immediate rewards for what they had done. And that didn't happen because the, the governor or the government of Virginia had to approve the payment and so forth. So it was slow. The Indians, the Cherokees, became disillusioned. So they filtered back from the Stanton area down through here on their way to the homeland in Tennessee and in um, North Carolina. But what happened is they started raiding and stealing horses, robbing houses, um, taking hostages, uh, and this happened widespread, and particularly in Halifax and Bodytot County. And um, so this is what was happening locally. Just below Smith Mountain Lake and one mile above the mouth of Pig River, uh, there was an engagement, some people from uh, Bedford County, and Henry Woody, who 
later settled in the Sontag area, uh, was in this group, that they came across the Indians down that had crossed over the Stanton River and were in what's now Pennsylvania County, and they engaged them there trying to get their horses back, uh, and they had a mild skirmish. They killed three Indians, and um, William Hall was killed. They uh, scalped the Indians and threw them in Stanton River, and the reason they scalped them was originally the French were paying for scalps and English scalps as well, uh, but then the state of Virginia started paying for Indian scalps as well, anywhere from five to ten pounds for each one. And that's about what a horse was worth at that time. So you can see why they would do that. Well, uh, they escaped. They, uh, the uh, local settlers did get horses back and a bunch of materials uh, that they left behind when they escaped. Well, shortly thereafter, in Franklin County on Blackwater River, they had a skirmish also because a Halifax um, militia party of 15 were coming along and they found that um, James Standifer's house on what's now Smith Mountain Lake and you, some people probably know where Standifer's Branch or, uh, is marked on Smith Mountain Lake uh, coming into the Blackwater. Well, Standifer lived there, and this was just down below the cliffs that many people know um, in, um, in and on the lake. But the um, Indians there had raided his house. They took his neighbor Bird's wife as a hostage, but they were plundering their house and she escaped. The Indians crossed over the river and they crossed over at a place that they had told uh, that the white settlers that joined them, another um, 30 uh, so joined them, the 15, and they had a group of about 40 that came along and um, they went across the river uh, to meet them and had a mild skirmish over, I think somewhere around where the Boxwood Green development is, uh, is where that took place. Not terribly far from the 4-H Center. But that was the only actual Indian engagement in Franklin County. But Indians were causing a real problem here and that was French and Indian War. And here you see the cliffs here. Standifer, um, Standifer Creek would be right down here. And the Indians uh, and the early settlers said that you would have to cross somewhere up here to cross that, and that's because of these cliffs. Um, so they are the landmarks we use to determine that. But um, this was the, the situation here and they were, that was the real problem. Now, there was, believe it or not, and bet you didn't know, we had an interstate through Franklin County 600 years before they started talking about Interstate 73, which is probably a figment of the imagination. But the Indians had an interstate from New York to Augusta, Georgia, 800 miles along that. And this was the Great Indian War Trace. And that eventually evolved into the Great Wagon Road uh, down uh, that same route and primarily from Philadelphia down. And then from the Roanoke area down, that was known as the Carolina Road because people were headed to Carolina. Well, many years ago, I was searching through the loose papers in Henry County and um, I came upon a, a deed of William McAhey. And the uh, Park Service had said that it was Cahaw's knob due to the Indian name for crows. But his land was right at the gap here. And it was obvious that the name Cahays came from William McAhey. The interesting thing on the 1747 deed was that at the foot of the mountain, 
by the river, Magadic Creek, uh, crossing the path, and the path was a great Indian war path coming across there. Now that was followed by the great um, wagon road that came through later. And the path, and here is a really a historic um, uh, slide that was given me by Mills Mann, one of the greatest early historians of Franklin County. And this is the Cat Steps Trail over Chestnut Mountain in southern Franklin County, the Sidnesville area. And this is an 18th century path that never became a road. And these followed uh, Buffalo Pass, but the Indians followed and used as a trail. And then the whites came along and they kept it also to cross over the mountains here um, and go into Henry and Pennsylvania County. But <clears throat> this became the great wagon road out of Philadelphia to Augusta, Georgia. And as you can see, it comes right through and we got Rocky Mount here. And then up at Amsterdam, just north of Roanoke, you could take uh, the Warrior Trace or the Great Wilderness Road going out, go up to Kentucky, down into Tennessee. So this road was the most heavily traveled road for the 16 years before the revolution in all America. And people traveled that going north, south, um, and it was the interstate of its day. And there were two routes, one the Stanton River Gap that you could cross the mountain or the Magadie Gap here, both went into the same uh, road here. And so then in 1748, Morgan Brown, who, was, um, who stayed at his brother William Brown up in the Roanoke Valley, uh, and he was the ancestor of William Jennings Brown, president, uh, but uh, Morgan Brown, cut a road from the Roanoke Valley to the Yadkin River uh, Basin in North Carolina, the Yadkin Settlement. He started that. Now that was a wagon road, took him three months to cut through uh, to get down there, but he carried a wagon and that was widely road, widely used road and it crossed the mountains at the Hardy Ford area uh, the Stanton Water Gap. But here you can see then from, from Roanoke down, this was known as a Carolina Road because people were headed to Carolina that didn't go west from Roanoke um, on the Wilderness Road. And you can see here's Rocky Mount and this is the Carolina Road going west. So uh, if we look at that today, um, here is Boone's Mill. That's the original Carolina Road going in the trace of the Carolina Road. The Carolina Road crossed the river uh, or Magadi Creek here 13 to 17 times, depending upon who you read early on. But basically it went down the river here. And then as you, uh, here is the Carolina Road sign that we originally placed uh, right there in Boone's Mill, but uh, the um, highway department decided in all their wisdom to put it at the Blackwater uh, River here and also the, uh, a fort sign and to put it down there and Ferrum College. So it's in the middle of nowhere compared to any of these three locations. But uh, here is uh, the original Boone's Mill and we're looking with, at Magadi Creek here, we're looking from the backside of Magadi Creek. Where these mills are today is 220 Highway uh, in Boone's Mill. And across the creek is still Jacob Boone's house of 1782. Um, and he established that and established the mills. Now that's looking at Magadi Creek and across Magadi Creek would be uh, those two mills. And as you come south from Boone's Mill, you can see the indentation in this field. That was the Carolina Road crossing at Retreat Road here. Um, and um, Bill and Nettie Short 
have built a house right here uh, at the present time. But you come on down to uh, Dugwell, and this is the Carolina Road. The Blackwater River goes here. Um, that's the Blackwater Crossing. And then uh, this is the Carolina Bottoms here, still known as the Carolina Bottoms. Here's the road coming out of the Ford, and there is the Narrows, which is the highland uh, between the bottom as the river makes a curl around here. Um, and right in here, in the Carolina Road, several years ago, a guy with a metal detector found a Connecticut 1786 penny, again showing you the interstate of its day with the travel coming through this particular area. Now this is the Narrows, the Highland area, and it's a farm road, but this is the original Carolina Road. And right to the right of that is a uh, rock ledge that is a cave back here, and it's called the Devil's Den. Now you can't see it, but uh, right here is a uh, full-grown teenager, uh, Steve Thompson, standing in the mouth of that many years ago. The Blackwater River is right down here. And what uh, the Indians would do, they would camp in this. The early settlers would come off the Carolina Road right above it and pull down, and uh, they would camp in here. Uh, and it's been a favorite camping place for Boy Scouts and other people for many, many years. As we go further down the Carolina Road, we find Carolina Springs Church right here. This is not the original church, but is one built on the site. The spring is right there, and the road went right through here. Uh, in 1769, they specified that they build a Church of England church here, and by the spring, uh, at the crossing of the Carolina Road and the Chiswell Road, which went west. And this was probably a culmination of the Pig River Road um, and the Warwick Road, one of the places to cross the road. 1761, they had set up Fort Chiswell in southwest Virginia out towards Whitfield. But here are some of the early uh, graves, most likely. This was a black church uh, more recently, um, and uh, some of the cemetery headstones from that. When you look uh, from that church, here's the original old road path uh, right by the church. Now, if we go further down to Wade Park, now, this was Wade Park uh, when we originally saved the road, which was the original Carolina Road, and when they started developing the road into Wade Park, they were going to go right over this, and so we convinced the Board of Supervisors to move the road over uh, just a little bit and save this as a walking trail, because this was the only preserved segment of the Carolina Road in Pennsylvania, Virginia, or the Carolinas at the time we saved that, that was on public land. So we accomplished that. Nowadays, the banks have eroded and fallen in, but there's still a walking trail up the original Carolina Road. And if you go a little further down at the ford on the river, this is the Carolina Road. This is the original stagecoach stop. This addition was built on in the 1880s. 1950, it burned, and only the chimneys are left uh, on that. The Pig River is right here, um, and the crossing is right over here. Uh, there was a blacksmith shop there, but this was a stagecoach stop from the 1790s uh, on down. Uh, here's Steve Thompson, the teenager I was telling you about, um, standing at the ruins of the chimneys, um, and the widow Ferguson had had this place. She left it. Um, to her grandson, uh, Wade, and that's where it takes the name, the Wade Recreation Park now. It was interesting that John Brown came through traveling in 1794, and at this very place, 
uh, he stayed there, and he was surprised because uh, in Franklin County, 30 Negroes were assembled at a Negro house and having a Christmas ball. It was Christmas time. And he was amazed that they had let the, um, that they'd let the slaves have a Christmas party here in Franklin County, Virginia, which is well documented. And uh, he stayed there and moved on the next day, but they were still celebrating Christmas. This road goes across up on top of Thor um, Thornton's Mountain, and from there you can see Rocky Mount, and the road went on down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and further south. Well, the real interesting thing about uh, the travel on the Carolina Road was who and what traveled. The um, early travelers, many walked, many rode horses. There were horse and wagons. There were herd of uh, sheep and cattle and hogs and turkeys, flocks of turkeys, and they would take them to market by driving them down the road. You were just unlucky if you were traveling on foot and following any of these herds in the road. But the real uh, thing that attracted everybody's attention was the big covered wagon, the Conestoga wagon. The Conestoga wagon weighed about two tons in itself, but it could carry about six tons. Uh, and it would carry commerce up and down the Carolina Road. These were the Teamsters. And if you had products to go to the market, they would take it and then bring you money back to you. But um, the have you ever wondered where America's red, white, and blue came from? It came from the Conestoga wagon, the red chassis, the blue body, and the white top. Now, some people say this is characteristic of Franklin County, um, but um, there's more to Franklin County than this. They say red, white, and blue, they're rednecks, they're blue collar, and they have white nightgown. Well, we might have red, white, and blue, but there's more to Franklin County than that. But there is a whole, uh, whole lot of history concerned with this. You ever thought why we drive on the left side and the English drive on the right? We're an English colony. Well, the lazy board on these kind of struggle wagons is right on the left. And the guy would sit on that and ride or ride on the horse here. And the driver probably was smoking a big stubby cigar called a stogie, uh, and that came from a kind of stoga wagon people. If he was a uh, driver from Georgia, uh, he traditionally used his whip on his horses a great deal, and that's where Georgia crackers came from. And then on your little lead horse here, you would have a little uh, series of bells set up. And it was tradition that if you broke an axle and somebody stopped and helped you to get going again, you would give them your set of bells from here. So if you saw a horse, um, a kind of stoga coming down, didn't have the um, bells on a horse, you would wonder how dependable they were uh, that they may not make it to market. So that's where our term, be there with bells on, means you can count on me. Uh, I'm reliable. Well, these road, this was a great wagon road that followed the Great Indian War Trace, came down, and this is a 1755 map, and it shows here the crossing of the Blackwater as well as um, the uh, Pig River here. This road, there was also another road called the Warwick Road. Warwick was a deep water terminal down below Richmond, and this road roughly was Route 460 that came west. Seven, that was 1746. 1749, you see a little sketch line, and they made a loop through Franklin County. And that was from New London across the mountains and then to the New River Valley. And that was a shortcut through there. 
and they were sending munitions from Williamsburg to the New River Valley, 1751, 1752, by this route coming this way. If you were driving cattle, uh, and there is a record, 1750s, that they would drive and take the Great Wagon Road or the Carolina Road, the market down to Salisbury, North Carolina. So coming out, going down there. The market for those days for the cattle was either Salisbury, North Carolina, or Philadelphia uh, for marketing. Well, this is where you rolled your tobacco. That Warwick Road that uh, the Warwick Road that we're talking about here was this road here going east and west, and that would take 460 up to about New London, then kind of cross Route 122, and um, then out the, the um, Callaway Road, and this would be roughly the Warwick Road extension here in Franklin County. But that was also the rolling road, and uh, up um, where you see the Crowell's Gap Road uh, at uh, Roanoke, uh, that was the earliest rolling road. And that's what they did. They rolled the tobacco, you would pack it in hogsets and that were like big drums, put an axle through that and take an oxen or a horse and you would pull that and you would take it all the way to Warwick uh, down at the deep water terminal at Richmond to put it on board the ship here and send it to Europe. Um, so that was a main ingress and so we will talk a little bit about something you probably didn't know about Franklin County. Here you see the Warwick Road coming east-west. There was a Pig River Road of 1753 that also went east-west. Now I want you to take Franklin County and cut it half in two, north and south. On the east part of that, you have the English and the Scots. This was tobacco raisin, and they brought in blacks to raise tobacco here in eastern Franklin County. These people came in with the Warwick Road, the Pig River Road, and there was Hickey's Road down here, just south of us, that dates to the 1740s. Well, then let's, uh, these were tobacco raises. Then on the west of that, west of this area, in the northwest corner, these were the Germanic tribes. These were the Dunkards. Came in um, 1764, William Miller brought in the Dunkards from Pennsylvania, and they came in. They were great at diversified farming, orchardists. Um, they um, did um, all kinds of things to make a living. They were very diversified and very ingenious with what they did. There's a loop out in the Red River, uh, out in the um, uh, Red Valley area here east that was extension uh, uh, and a great deal of our Dunkards, the Germanic people live out in there. Now, in the southwest, we had the Scotch-Irish. They all came down the Great Wagon Road, and but the Scotch-Irish were very independent people. They were originally lowland Scots that got uh, moved with great promises up to Ireland, and then they got up there, and by 1608, the government was clamping down, wouldn't let them sell their supplies elsewhere but to them, and this, that, and the other. They became disillusioned, got on the boat, came to Pennsylvania, came south looking for cheap land. They wanted land in the hinterlands and the mountains so nobody would bother them. They didn't want to be told anything by authority. Uh, and they were very independent, great uh, uh, Indian fighters and very independent people. These are the moonshiners and the woodworkers of southwestern Franklin County. Um, and again, uh, a reflection of their independent spirit there. So this makes up the county. We're very diversified. So here you've got your English, Scots, and Blacks over here primarily. Germanic people up here coming in with Carolina, the Carolina Road or Great Wagon Road, the Scotch-Irish down here. Um, so these roads determined in large measure how people got to Franklin County. 
Well, um, you um, start, um, you wonder about Daniel Boone. He was a great frontiersman. Bet you didn't know that his first long hunt was through Franklin County. In 1750, his daddy was moving down the Carolina Road and was going down to the Yadkin. Um, and so Daniel Boone, being impatient, was 16 years old. His dad wintered in Harrisonburg. So Daniel got him a partner and started hunting down the Great Carolina Road, came down to the uh, Big Lick, or what's now Roanoke, uh, and that was a big salt lick with lots of game. So they killed lots of game there, came down, crossed the Hardy Ford Bridge where Morgan Brown had cut the road in 1748, uh, and that was the road his dad was following to the Yadkin. Um, and it's interesting that Daniel Boone uh, went down and um, he grew up down in the Yadkin, and he and the Boone family is just in a married. As a matter of fact, he married, um, uh, Daniel Boone married Morgan Brown's granddaughter, which he met at um, Billy Brown, who was a 16-year-old son of Morgan Brown, and uh, Billy Brown married Daniel Boone's sister. So they were all inter uh, interlaced one way or the other, the two families, and um, Billy Brown went with Daniel Boone out to establish Boonesboro, and then established his own fort, Brown's Station, um, and was killed by Indians in 1780 there. But Daniel Boone did make his original trip, his hunting trip, uh, here in Franklin County. And what he did, he crossed up at the Hardy Ford Bridge now and came down the eastern part of the mountains here and went down to the Carolinas uh, for this. Then he went back up and sold and uh, they made great money and uh, he squandered his, his partner made good use of his money. Well, he was one of the original long hunters, they call it, and this was indigenous to Southwest Virginia. Long hunters were hunters that once they got their crops in at their farm, they would take out hunting in October and they would stay out until April. Uh, they would take two horses to put their pelt and their furs on uh, and lots of traps and their gun. Uh, and no more than about two people at a time would go out together. They didn't want to incite the Indians. So uh, they would go out hunting. Tradition has it that one of the places they crossed the Blue Ridge was Shoats Gap in Franklin County. Uh, the Buffalo Knob over here, Haynes Knob over here, this was Shoats Gap. Well, it's interesting uh, that one of my patients uh, years ago was uh, plowing land right at the spring there in Shoats Gap, and uh, Posey Wade uh, plowed up this Indian axe here of about 6,000 years old. But the interesting thing was, and this had been scuffed up, I saw it when he originally found it, it has the date 1732. That's at least 10 years before any permanent settlers came into Franklin County. Again, evidence of Long Hunter had found this at, and near the spring and sat there and scratched the date on it and threw it down, got his water and camped there probably overnight and moved on uh, in the hunt of, um, uh, of in, in, uh, his hunting expedition. But I will say the um, long hunters had a long history in Franklin County. Gideon and Daniel Smith were early long hunters, and they are the people that gave the name to Smith Mountain and Smith Mountain Lake now. Uh, they were long hunters, and these people traditionally were squatters. They didn't actually have a lot of land or anything. But uh, they, would, uh, uh, they would stay here for a little while and then move on. The Walden family, uh, that is well known, um, 
as early long hunters in southwest Virginia, Wallens Ridge now, out near Big Stone Gap, named after these are regions and lands that uh, these early hunters explored and killed game. Uh, the um, early long hunter uh, for a male deer hide would get one buck, one dollar. So we still speak of a dollar as a buck coming from those long hunter days. And during the winter when they couldn't be doing anything that stayed here, they were out hunting and was very lucrative. They would make sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars uh, for their winter's hunt, bringing back buffalo hides, and there were still buffaloes here, uh, buffalo hides uh, in the southwest Virginia um, were sold uh, very readily to England, and deer hides and pelts, uh, they were a big commodity. Well, the Carolina Road was also a road uh, for travel, and this is the oldest piece of Franklin County furniture we know of, and this belonged to Benjamin uh, Ray, who lived on Magadie Creek. The Moravians, when they left Pennsylvania, headed to uh, Old Salem, North Carolina, uh, Winston-Salem now. Uh, they stopped on Magadie Creek and Fred Benjamin Ray's, and they got milk. He was 90 years old, his wife was 100. Uh, this table came from Magadie Creek, the Ray family, and it has been verified by the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts at Old Salem, North Carolina, and Colonial Williamsburg as dating to the 1750s. And most assuredly, it was Benjamin Ray's, uh, since there were very few people in that area by that time. He was there by the 1740s. So just again, evidence of travel up and down. It was uh, a route of commerce. Uh, for a long, long time. And here's a Jamestown, North Carolina um, rifle that lots of these poured into Franklin County from that uh, gunsmith school down in North Carolina in the 1750s. There's Rockingham Ware that we find it all. This is pottery from North Carolina that we find locally um, in the mid-1800s here. This is a iron pig made it to Washington Iron Works in Rocky Mount that headed south um, and they would sell to the Moravians Bologna, they called it, uh, and also bar iron uh, and it would go south. So this is the commerce that you would see. Even the Pennsylvania uh, hinges here that are local hinges showing the tulip uh, end to that. Well, bet you didn't know that George Washington also visited Franklin County. Um, in 1756, um, there, uh, during the French and Indian War, there was a real problem with the Indians coming across the mountains and, and causing incursions here and real problems. So George Washington was a colonel at that time, and he set out to um, put a series of forts and along the mountains and along the mountain passes so as to keep the Indians from coming across and, and endangering the eastern part of the mountains. So he set out to inspect these forts, and one of the forts was Fort Blackwater here in Callaway uh, in Franklin County. So George Washington's route was from Fort Vaughs. He crossed one of the gaps Adney Gap maybe, but maybe Daniel's Run or Norway Ridge or one of the Canada's Gap. There are several gaps. But he came across, came down to Fort Blackwater, then over to the Carolina Road, down to Fort Trial, down uh, at Martinsville, and then down to Patrick County, Fort Mayo. Fort Mayo was the most southern fort and then for a trial, and he went back up the Carolina Road here. But he did. He stopped at Fort Blackwater. Uh, this fort was erected in 1756 was, um, by uh, uh, Nathaniel Terry, 
Um, and there was a garrison of about 20 soldiers placed in it for about a year. But then they uh, did away with the garrison so uh, forts, both this and Fort Trial, and put them all down at the south at Fort Mayo. But then they used this as they would have ranging companies going to the New River Valley. They would stop here and spend the night here and then go on across the mountain. Uh, however, with the incursions we talked about in 1757, uh, 58 in Franklin County, um, and that at the time was Halifax County, Bedford County, uh, there were a lot of atrocities. So in uh, 1761, they had 75 soldiers stationed at Fort Blackwater. And here you can see the Callaway Road headed with Callaway being back over here. You can see the mountains here. And the Indians were using passes to come across near here. This would be the Warwick Road here, the Callaway Road. And this eventually went on and went across the mountain. But these Indian incursions were happening. Robert Pusey, 1758, uh, lived on the Otter River uh, here in uh, southwestern Franklin County. Uh, the Indians captured him, his wife, and his child. They killed one child uh, and took him hostage and back to Ohio. He was at uh, Detroit for several years, and six years later he was at an Indian village in Ohio. Didn't, didn't make his way back till much, much later. 1784 he was petitioning the government to get his property back. Uh, when he came back he had nothing. Everything was destroyed and everything was gone. Uh, so that's what was uh, what they were facing here. We don't know where Fort Blackwater was. Uh, it's always been thought that this is the South Fork and the North Fork of the Blackwater River coming together to make Blackwater there. That it was somewhere near here since uh, Joseph uh, Renfro lived near here and a horse was borrowed uh, by um, a uh, officer at the fort to go down to Fort Trial and they borrowed his horse so they assumed he lived nearby. We really don't know uh, where the fort was, as many of these forts, they just haven't been found. But bet you didn't know, George Washington could easily have gotten killed uh, in his travel over the Gap, Adney Gap, or wherever uh, he crossed, because it is recorded, and he records that two hours uh, after he had passed through the gap, two men were killed by Indians uh, in that gap. So uh, can you imagine what history would be like if George Washington had gotten killed in Franklin County um, back in 1756 uh, before the Revolutionary War, before he was president? History would be quite different. Well, Bet you didn't know that two people were killed by Indians here in Rocky Mount. Uh, this is Robert Hill's old fort, uh, and this is on the Christian Heritage property, the remains of that. And it was a fortified dwelling. As a matter of fact, this is a fortified little window here. Uh, the, the actual uh, hinge to that was part of the post that went into the masonry there. Uh, that part of the wall fell and only this end is still standing, but has been partially rebuilt um, just to show you the remains of that. This was built probably in the late 1740s. He was a um, landowner here, 1749. But Robert Hill had a son that was killed in the doorway of this fort um, and he had another son that was killed on Ball Knob Rock by Indians. And Robert Hill's grave is right in front of the armory uh, here right off Ten Yard Road. So um, it was a wild and woolly time, but he also had a third son 
that was killed by a cougar or mountain lion uh, on Scufflin Hill. So times were rough, but uh, Robert Hill himself was in the uh, battle in 1774. Uh, Cornstalk, the Indian uh, of the Shawnees, uh, got together the Mingo Indians. And so uh, they, um, the big battle was fought up at Point Pleasant. 1774, Andrew Lewis had local troops and Robert Hill was in that. And this was hand-to-hand -hand combat with Mingo and Shawnee Indians. Uh, and Robert Hill was one of the people in that. This is to show you this is a war club of a Shawnee Indian and his Indian bead that he was wearing at the time showing that he uh, was a warrior uh, for this expedition. Um, interestingly, these beads were made in Williamsburg of glass and traded to the Indians, and they had used them as a war symbol at that time. This is a powder horn that um, uh, a um, soldier Bracken out in um, uh, Greenbrier had this, he was attacked by a Mingo Indian, which hit his powder horn, busted it, and then uh, tomahawked him and killed him. Uh, the sergeant took this back to the family. Uh, and if you look inside that horn, you can't see that very good, but uh, there are Indian streak, uh, uh, blood streaks of uh, Bracken's blood. So that's how vicious the war was, and we failed to uh, give tribute to these rough and tough settlers that settled uh, our nation for us. Robert Hill is buried in the cemetery right in front of the uh, National Guard Army here in Rocky Mount, died in 1778, uh, but a true warrior himself. Bet you didn't know that Patrick Henry uh, stayed in Franklin County too. Patrick Henry retired as governor of Virginia, 1775, and moved to Leatherwood in Henry County. And that's how Henry County got its name, was after Patrick Henry. He was there 1775 to 1780. He was a lawyer. He would go to court at New London. And as he did so, he loved to hunt. And he would stop at the Ashpone Tavern which is across the road and in the area, uh, just across the road from the Sontag Recreational Center. Now, he uh, would come by, fox hunt, then proceed on to New London after court. He would then come back, fox hunt, and then go home to Leatherwood. So uh, here is a, a large Dutch oven that came from the old Ashbone Tavern, and either they were cooking for a lot of people or some very hungry people. It's about 14 inches across, three and a half inches deep, uh, but my great granddaddy found that uh, many, many, many years ago um, at the old Ashbone Tavern site. Well, tobacco has always been a big commodity here. From early on, that was uh, a early commodity. And here, the Captain Frederick Reeves house down on Pig River, um, down in the Glade Hill area. Um, and this was built in 1779. And here you see the tobacco lands. The Pig River circles right down here. Here's the house. All this was tobacco land. And he came up, was an early, uh, leader of Henry and Franklin County. But um, we had 17 tobacco factories in 1861 here in Franklin County. Uh, it was a big, big commodity. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, Billy, um, um, the, uh, there was a brown, Brown's log cabin chewing tobacco during the Civil War. Uh, and Billy Brown had, down in the Figsboro area, 
a tobacco factory that was well known. This was a later sold out to um, R.J. Reynolds and the brown mule chewing tobacco that was a later uh, sequela of this um, goes back to that. But way back, uh, there were tobacco barns like this, and here you cured your tobacco. They would pull the tobacco as it began to leather and tie it up on sticks and house it up in the tobacco barn. And then they had two flue eyes here, and they would have logs that they would stick up in that flue to regulate the temperature. And it was critical that the temperature had to be closely monitored. And so day and night you had to stay with that four or five days to cure your tobacco and start off at the very low temperature to yellow the tobacco and then as it yellowed, then to go ahead and uh, raise the temperature and the color would go to a golden brown and um, that golden color was what you wanted for wrappers for wrapping cigars and uh, that brought the best price. But to do that, you had to spend a night here and here with the lanterns hung out. Um, and I can remember as a child, my dad spending the night curing tobacco, getting up every couple of hours, checking the temperature, moving the fire in and out to keep the te temperature very closely monitored. Uh, my brother and I would sleep in the old wagon there uh, with a straw tick we put in it and a covering across with tobacco sticks and a canvas and we were camping out and we would uh, in the the flu eyes there we would um, um, roast apples or corn or potatoes or whatever you wanted to eat uh, and that was the fun of it. Today these tobacco barns are being saved. There's a big program in Pennsylvania County, Halifax County, and one of the counties in North Carolina to save tobacco barns, but they are rapidly, rapidly disappearing today. Well, people look for all kinds of ways of making money, and I bet you didn't know we had copper mines here in Franklin County on top of Grassy Hills. They're copper mines, and they're still visible today. And um, it used to be that you could see specks of a greenish rock up there, which was the um, copper in the rock that had tarnished and had a greenish color. And here you see uh, my son standing up here and his buddy down in the pit here, but uh, their pits up on Grassy Hill from copper mines. And that is mentioned that the road going through the um, present route across Grassy Hill, uh, they mentioned by the copper mines and to the ironworks in Rocky Mount. And this was the 1770s, uh, prior to the revolutionary, uh, the um, uh, 1770, prior to the Revolutionary War. So here, the iron works was a major industry in Franklin County. That actually was 1851, but was put back in operation for a little bit during the Civil War. Bet you didn't know that the iron works in Rocky Mount was established by President Andrew Jackson's father-in-law. Yes, um, President Andrew Jackson's wife was Rachel Donaldson, the beautiful Rachel Donaldson of the Hermitage. Her daddy, John Donaldson, built the original iron furnace here in, uh, and it, I didn't, it was not an iron furnace, it was a bloomery furnace, um, but it was uh, established in 1773 here, and it operated for a period of time and then he sold that to James Calloway, and he took a flatboat expedition from the Holston River in southwest Virginia, along with a bunch of settlers, down the Holston, out the Tennessee, up the Ohio, and out the Cumberland River to become one of the original founders of Nashville, Tennessee. 
And if you go into Nashville today, you'll see Donaldson Highway, and uh, he was one of the original founders. Uh, she was 13 years old when they left, and it was there that she met Andrew Jackson and married Andrew Jackson there, uh, who later became president. Well, <clears throat> what uh, James Calloway did, he went up and developed a larger operation with a uh, blast furnace, and he expanded the plantation to 18,000 acres, and the town of Rocky Mount grew up around this. Here you can see the little chisel marks in the stone. And what they did, they went up on the rock ledge on um, Scufflin Hill, right across the creek from the furnace, and they took iron chisels and chiseled these in a linear line, put wood down in that, soaked it with water, and as that swelled, it would crack the rock in a straight line. And that way they could get straight stones for erecting this. But the result was that they built a large iron furnace. And here you can see this furnace was built in 1779. Look at the edges on that now and how true it is. Um, and what they did, they built this. Here you can see the notch for the furnace, uh, for the um, platform, there was a bridge that went across here, and they would bring limestone ore, charcoal, uh, and uh, the iron ore, and dump all three of these down in that. Uh, this would be 2,700 degrees down in here. You had a pumping tub or a pumping bellows here that would pump air into it to keep that temperature high. Then of that iron ore, about 50% would be iron. They would then have a long furrow with some side furrows. It looked like pigs sucking a sow, and that's what you get pig iron. And I showed you a piece of the pig iron um, previously. They would take that to the forge, remelt it, and beat it into iron bars. Here you can see part of the dam. That would have a sluiceway coming down here, a big water wheel here that would be turning a, iron, a large axle that would force the air in by pumping tubs in here. Um, this, was, uh, this was established during the Revolutionary War. And the announcement of the opening of the Washington Iron Furnace and George Washington hadn't won a war in 1779. It wasn't until 1781 that he got the uh, surrendered Yorktown. But he was a friend of James Calloway, and so he named it after him. But this was in the Journal of the State of South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina, when this was uh, published. And it was said that they were making kettles and camp kettles, that's for the Revolutionary War, and any kind of iron articles here, spice mortars, forge uh, anvils, and so forth. Almost anything you wanted made out of iron, they would make it. It's interesting that prior to this time, if you wanted a iron pot or, or a, a skillet or anything out of iron, you had to order that from England. It would be brought uh, across and down to the deep water terminal at Richmond, at Warwick, up the Warwick Road to New London, to the stores up there, um, or to Hickey's store down in uh, Henry County. But that was a long ways to transport iron, which was very heavy. So you can see why when this was established, and you could buy these articles right here in Rocky Mount, that there were so many roads coming from every direction into here, and it was like the center of a hub um, with the spokes out, uh, with the, all the roads coming in. <clears throat> so here you have the iron furnace settled down and quite an industry established in 1779. It was totally self-sufficient. 
and the iron was quarried here in these large tunnel um, on Windsor Avenue and Diamond Avenue extension. You'll see extensive uh, furrows here and the refuge thrown up on his side. Um, Zeb Perry here standing on one of the embankments. And here you can see uh, what's all over this area. Also on Route 40 West to the right, uh, there are furrows in the hill where they were digging iron ore. But the furnace was here, the oil was here, they brought in, char uh, they brought in uh, charcoal from the coaling grounds, which was Doe Run area. That's the reason they had to have 18,000 acres. They burned an acre of day of hardwood, of charcoal, um, and a acre a day at the forge as well. So that's two acres a day of charcoal hardwood. Um, and they brought the limestone from 16 miles down road at the Truvine area down on Pig River. They had their own tavern, their own store, uh, their mills. They raised their own garden um, produce here. Uh, so it was like a self-sufficient um, feudal plantation. Here the forge that was down river, down where the uh, public works are at uh, for the Rocky Mount uh, maintenance shops. Uh, that's where the forge was. And here they are reheating the iron pigs and sticking them down, making iron uh, bar. I think it's important, and bet you didn't know, that the Washington Iron Works of Franklin County produced about 15% of the iron for the American Revolution. And that's according to Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which he published in 1782. And that's the only book that he actually published. But uh, this is true. Uh, and, he, and these are taken from his figures of the iron products that were given for the Revolutionary War. And yes, we did produce munitions as well. They were making cannonballs here for the troops, particularly for General Green's troops in the Southeastern Expedition here that um, resulted eventually in the surrender at Yorktown. Here are some of the implements of war made here uh, on the um, side here, the left. That's a trench spear. That had a 10-foot long pole to it, and the guys behind embankments would have these, and they could prevent troops coming up the embankment. If you were on level ground, you could plant those, and horses with cavalry couldn't override you. Um, so these trench spears were used early on very much. This particular cannonball fell off the wagon uh, going up the hill just past Wade Park. Uh, Mr. Bussey found that in the Carolina Road uh, quite a few years ago, uh, and that was one of the loads of cannonballs headed down to um, the uh, Greens troops down in the Carolinas, which eventually uh, ended up at Guilford Courthouse and the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, where Green was able to turn Cornwallis eastward and then eventually up to Yorktown and the surrender. Here's a tomahawk that was found in our uh, yard um, down where they had a little blacksmith shop there. And they made these for the Revolutionary War. You either had to have a bayonet or a tomahawk. And a tomahawk you could do a lot more with. You could skewer a uh, rabbit maybe on a uh, bayonet, uh, but that's about all you could do. With uh, this tomahawk you could dress a um, uh, a rabbit, or you could uh, beat in a uh, tent stake or chop some wood, so multiple purposes for that. And the troops much, much preferred these and a great defensive uh, weapon. This is the iron furnace that was established, the industry, Franklin County's first industry. This is Furnish Creek and named after the furnace. 
And here to the right, this is Scufflin Hill. The, uh, the slaves said it was a real scuffle to get up that steep hill to their slave cabins on top of the ridge. It's still known as Scufflin Hill. So here's a sketch of a iron plantation. You have your iron furnace here. The iron master's house was up on the hill above that. You have the slave quarters on the ridge over here. The forge for making uh, bar iron from the molten iron from here, the pig iron, and then storage facilities. So it became quite a complex, and that's what it was here. Remember, this was the Revolutionary War, and um, we contributed uh, munitions to the Green Campaign that forced the end of the war and forced Cornwallis out to the side up to Yorktown, and from there, the surrender at Yorktown. Well, that's not the end of the story, because in World War II, we had already provided iron for the Revolution, for the War of 1812, for the Mexican War, for the Civil War, but in World War II, there was an iron shortage. And they went down to the old forge site and dug and got hundreds of pounds of iron to contribute to the World War II uh, iron shortage. And here you can see an American helmet from Normandy with the wounds of um, machine gun, here artillery fire of a German helmet, and this is on one of the maps um, of World War II. Um, and so you can see we contributed to World War II with iron from here. Well, on the same iron plantation, the Iron Master's house, in 1784 had also been given a license as an ordinary, and that was like a tavern. People could come, they could spend the night buying iron, and at a ordinary or tavern, they were able to um, get a few drinks and find out from the visitors traveling through exactly what was going on in the rest of the world. So they specified, the, the uh, state did in 1785, that the formation of Franklin County in 1786, that they meet at James Calloway's house at the Iron Works. And so here it was that they met, 1786. Interestingly, this uh, iron part of a stove plate with a German inscription here has the magic date of 1786 and they would change that date every year uh, that it was made. But uh, this was found uh, in the furnace or at the furnace here uh, in Rocky Mount. The Germans liked stoves, the English liked open fireplaces, uh, but these uh, had German inscription, biblical inscriptions in iron. But it was in this room at uh, the Callaway's house that the iron works, which is our house today. Um, and in 1986, with the bicentennial, we had a recreation of the creation of Franklin County. Uh, and here were the Board of Supervisors and other people, and that's Rick Huff there. Only survivor Noel Parcell still living today. Well, the courthouse, after January, February, and March, they met down at um, the house at the Iron Works. And then by April, they'd built the first log courthouse on the site of the present courthouse. Callaway uh, then built a large tavern, 84 feet long, right above that, right above what, where the statue is today. Uh, that was a large tavern. And needless to say, there was more business taken care of at the tavern than probably the courthouse at that time. And it had a full set bar that you could uh, buy grog or whatever, the 18th century, um, whatever they had at that time, flip or whatever. Uh, you could buy all kind of things as well 
as a store was incorporated in that as well. But <clears throat> the courthouse of 1786 was a log courthouse that was replaced 1831 by this courthouse on the same site. <clears throat> and in 1909, they started work on this, dedicated in 1913. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> This is a small piece of uh, the deed of, uh, or the will of uh, 1809, James Calloway's will. And James Calloway left a small tract of land known as Rocky Mount to his son, James Calloway Jr., including the tavern uh, and the land other than what had been reserved for the courthouse. Uh, I thought that was interesting. But James Calloway had lots of land besides the 18,000 acre iron plantation. He had multiple plantations, particularly in the Calloway area. And then he had the large track along with John Early from Calloway back over the mountains on to Floyd County of, um, uh, I believe that was, um, uh, 67,784 and one-fourth acres in that tract. So he had plenty of land. Well, Keister Greer wrote a interesting uh, book on the early genesis of the Virginia frontier, 1740 to 17, um, um, I believe he's got it, 1775. Uh, but um, this was the very early beginnings of the county. And Keister, at the time, and he wrote this at the University of Virginia um, when he was getting his degree, but he discovered at that time Old Chapel Church that was still standing here in Franklin County. Uh, and this was published in the Roanoke Times. Well, Old Chapel Church persisted and is still there. Uh, but uh, it, uh, the congregation died out. It was beginning to fall apart and was placed on the market in 2011. I couldn't find anybody to buy that, so my wife and I bought it, and we started restoring that. Um, and here is the cornerstone of the 1769 church that came from right there. Um, but it was restored, and this is my hunting and fishing and history buddy, Zebediah Perry, called Zeb Perry, um, and he's using the uh, big key to unlock the door with an equally big lock inside, and that serves two purposes. It's to lock in the parishioners and to lock the devil out. I don't know which is more effective, but the the senior architectural historian at Colonial Williamsburg, Carl Lounsbury, uh, saw the picture of this church uh, just as we were beginning to start. He is America's authority on colonial churches, has written the history of Bruton Parish Church and uh, has done the research on the church at Jamestown uh, and he was tickled to death when he found these notches in the sidewall. Uh, he came up along with the curator of architecture of Colonial Williamsburg and spent two days authenticating the old chapel church. And here, uh, what he found was the post and beam structure inside this church was never covered until after 1900. That dated from 1769 to 1900. This is the original structure that you see with the beams above. And what he found there, those notches are the platform for the pulpit, which in true 18th century Anglican architecture, the pulpit was on the sidewall. You had a reader's desk because most Sundays you didn't have the actual preacher, but they would read from the Book of Common Prayer uh, and the, the reader would do that from this uh, point of view. So this is the appearance of that, but he authenticated this, and this church is now one of only four 
frame pre-revolutionary war Church of England churches in all Virginias that still stand in that are documented. Uh, one of which is St. John's Church in Richmond where Patrick Henry gave his give me liberty or give me death speech. This is also the oldest frame structure in all Southwest Virginia. Here is Carl Lounsbury's book on the Bruton Parish Church. And he was very much impressed with the guttered corner post here. Here you can see the corner post has been cut out at an angle. And he was impressed because this architecture didn't come to Colonial Williamsburg until the 1750s. He was amazed that 1769, it was out here on the frontier. Um, and he stated that was state-of-the-art uh, architecture at the time. And I told Carl, I said, Carl, we're not half as far behind as you all give us credit for out here. These are the saviors of Old Chapel Church. Uh, these are the six, which I call the super six. These guys work almost every weekend for four years, volunteer work to preserve this old church. And here with the uh, state and national certification, and uh, they're on the national register, um, we have Jerry Adcock, Kevin Hunt, Perry Adcock, his uh, twin brother, uh, Rick Fry here, Gerald Kirk, and Carl Kirk. These are the people that restored this church. And they did this because they wanted to see uh, this preserved and a tribute to the early Christian heritage of Franklin County and of America and to the early Christians that founded this nation. And this is a tribute to God and to those early workers that, um, that brought religion into our area. This is St. John's Church in Richmond where Patrick Henry gave his give me liberty or give me death speech. Uh, this is unique architecture and Colonial Williamsburg said, whatever you do, don't cover up that pillar and scroll. With the, I'll bet you didn't um, know that Thomas Jefferson's secretary was living here in Franklin County in 1804. Well, William Burwell moved to Franklin County in 1802, and in 1804, he was Thomas Jefferson's private secretary. By 1806, he was a member of the legislature at Richmond, and then on to Congress, and was a national congressman, and served until his death in 1821. He remained a very close personal friend of Thomas Jefferson, and they corresponded right up until his death, particularly about agriculture issues and things like that, uh, but they were very, very uh, close. He lived uh, down at near Jack's Mountain in Glade Hill at the Burwell House. John Spotswood Burrell built this in 1798, uh, and this is where he lived. And I think it's interesting, and a story told me by Ms. Mann, who was a senior architectural historian, um, he um, said, um, she, she told me that she met this old gentleman that was a direct descendant, and he told this story that um, William Burwell here had a good library, apparently same in common with the love of books that Thomas Jefferson had, and in this, he had a first folio book of Shakespeare's works. And that's a very famous book printed in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare died, of Shakespeare's work. This was a extremely large uh, volume. And at any rate, this passed to his son that built Avenel in Bedford County and then on down to descendants. And along the way, it was sold to the British Library 
uh, and was sold to use the money for one of the descendants to go to medical school. Well, uh, this old fellow had remembered the Bible from being in the family, and so in his travels, he went by the library and he asked to see the, uh, the book. And the curator discussed with him that he would get the book, but said, yeah, you must be uh, mistaken here. These were very, very valuable books from the time they were uh, published and were only in the very richest or in universities or whatever. And I think there were something like 250 published, um, and nowadays there are only like 235 known. But at any rate, he explained that they were very, very valuable, that he doubted it was in his ancestors' hands. So he went and got the book, and he brought it. And so this old gentleman told him, he said, I want you to turn to so-and-so page. He said, when I was a youngster, I was eating a jelly biscuit, and I dropped jelly on the bottom of the page. He opened it up, and there was the stain. The um, guy said no more. Yes, slavery was an institution here in Franklin County. It was uh, one of those terrible institutions where families were separated, uh, people were sold as property, and was one of the main reasons, um, and with the Southern economy based upon agriculture of cotton and tobacco, uh, with slave labor, uh, it was a cornerstone of the whole economy here. And so there were slave markets, particularly down at Richmond, Chaco Slip area, uh, Norfolk, um, Charleston, South Carolina, and um, James Smith, an old gentleman I knew, he told me about um, Judy Dudley, who lived to be 106 years old, that lived down right across from the old Dudley School, and she uh, had been a midwife uh, for the area for many, many years, but she had told him that she walked with her mom from Georgia with trading Tom Dudley, who lived in that area and was a slave trader, but uh, he took a group from Georgia and walked back here, and she was a little girl at that time. Interestingly, there were all kinds of uh, ways. Uh, many of the local people tried to keep the families together. Now, in the 1830s, Nellie Green was a free black, and she bought her husband and then passed him on to four of her seven children when she died in 1834 so that they could keep the family together but it was slavery, the economic situation, there were states' rights, these people were sons and grandsons of those people that had fought for the revolution, who felt like that they fought because they uh, had taxation with no representation, and nobody would listen to their pleas for what they wanted here, so um, there were all kinds of reasons uh, that brought on the war between the states or the Civil War. Here, a slave cabin. Uh, this was a type thing that they lived in many times in rows on the bigger plantation. But as in Franklin County, uh, only about 25% of the people uh, here had slaves in 1786, and the same thing in 1761. Um, only a small group of people actually had slaves. And if so, many times it was less than five. Here's a slave overseer's cane, came from the, um, uh, the plantation, Wade Plantation down at Sidnersville. And this is um, made of a Celtis wood, which is an African wood with black streak in it. And this was carved most likely in Africa. And these canes would be carved and sold to slave markets. 
and they would be uh, they would then sell them to slave owners that came to buy slaves. Um, the slave market itself um, had to be fairly indigenous after 1806. 1806, they passed laws that you couldn't import slaves after that period of time. So slaves were shuffled north, south, uh, wherever. There was slavery in industries up north, but more slaves down south uh, for agriculture. Well, the Civil War broke out with whatever the issues were, and this young uh, Arrington youth from here in Franklin County is all ready for the war. As you can see, and you can't see, he's holding a bowie knife here. He has a sword here, two Colt pistols here, and a carbine here. So he's all ready to fight the war, maybe single-handedly. But at any rate, the most famous battle and best known battle of the Civil War was the Battle of Gettysburg. And Franklin County soldiers were in the forefront in that. Here you can see the third day at Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. Cushing's guns were just back of this stone wall here. The troops under Armistead in front here, uh, and right in front of this, uh, they were proceeding and to take on the Yankees behind this wall. Well, the, they poured gunfire right into them, and the, the Yankees were so impressed with the fact that when they did so, they would just drop down and the guys would step right up, keep line and marching straight into the face of the guns. And so here you can see General Armstead leading in Pickett's charge across the stone wall right here as the troops, and this would be the 57th Regiment of Franklin County, had three companies in that right behind Armstead. The 24th Regiment was right over here to the side, and they were charging right over the wall. And this is probably the best representation here. General Armstead had his hat on his sword going over the wall, which is right here. This is labeled 57th Regiment uh, coming right over the wall right behind him. Armstead put his hand on Cushing's gun. He was mortally wounded at this point in time. The flag of the 57th right behind. This, uh, these are my uh, great great uncles, um, John and Bob Hutchison. This is John Hutchison. He was flag bearer for the 57th Regiment. And when I was a young man, my grandfather was born in 1868, just three years after the end of the Civil War. And um, he told me that his uncle had the flag and the Yankees were behind a rock wall up on a hill and they charged it and uh, that he had the flag in his hand when he was killed at the wall. Well, he had been told this by numerous neighbors, all of which had fought with him in the 57th Regiment at uh, Gettysburg. And it was interesting, Zeb Perry and I were at the Civil War show uh, a couple of years ago, and um, this uh, artist from Richard, from Richmond had painted this picture of the 57th Regiment and the guy, the flag bearer, getting killed at the stone wall here. Um, <clears throat> so um, I told him the, the story of this, and he couldn't believe that he had painted that without knowing it. But that flag was picked up and carried to the high water mark, the 57th Regiment, uh, at Gettysburg. Out of 12,500 soldiers that started that charge, about 150 made it over the stone wall to the high water mark at Gettysburg. There's now a mark of the high water mark at Gettysburg. From this point on, the tides of war went downhill and uh, it was uh, downhill for the rest of the war. This really was the high tide of the Confederacy. Franklin County's most famous uh, soldier 
and general was General Jubal Early. General Early was an interesting character. He was uh, a real fighting man's uh, soldier, uh, afraid of nothing, and um, was very forthright. Um, he was a heavy drinker. Um, he was a even heavier cusser, and was General Lee called him his bad old man because he was the only man that would cuss in front of, Juba, of uh, General Lee. But General Lee really liked him because he was so good as a soldier. And uh, so Jubal uh, was born and raised here in Franklin County. This is the early homestead over near Windy Gap Mountain. This is the earliest mountain here as part of the Windy Gap uh, Mountain State. Uh, the old office to the plantation here. The house has been fully restored, 1814. Jubal Early was born in 1816. He um, was raised here. He was the Commonwealth's attorney for Franklin and Floyd County in the 1840s. Um, and he lived in a, a hotel in Rocky Mount there for a period of time. He met a young gal that was working there named Julia McNeely and uh, she became his mistress. And so out on Trail Drive, he bought a tract of land and had a log cabin, which he kept her in. He had four children by her, and uh, they were raised. Then he was off to war, and after the war, was in Canada for a period of time. But um, she remarried, and he did give his name early to the four, his four kids uh, in the 1870s. Well, um, these, some of the early family have come back and had reunions here in the county, and I spoke to them um, on several occasions, and um, I told them they were the nicest bunch of bastards I'd ever talked to. Um, but they enjoyed their visit here. Jubal Early was a soldier's soldier, uh, and he had quite the reputation. He has, he um, went the furthest north, came the closest to capturing Washington of anyone, and with a force of only about 14,000, he tied up 40,000 uh, Yankee troops, which took the pressure off early uh, off uh, General Lee uh, down in Richmond and Petersburg. And in effect, he prolonged the war by six months by doing so. Jubal Early um, has a all-time record that is the record for the annals of American warfare. He marched his troops 1,500 miles in four months and was engaged in 75 skirmishes and major battles. And that is a record that no one has come close in any theater uh, of war. Now, there are multiple books written about him. After the war, he did with the pen what he couldn't do with the sword. He um, was the um, editor of the uh, Southern Historical Society. He wrote uh, lots of articles, cleared up a lot of misgivings about the war, particularly published by Yankee generals, used facts and figures to prove his point, and much of what we read about today is due to the accuracy that he enforced after the war. He was a leading cause of the Lost Cause movement. He was um, early uh, was the person that almost canonized uh, um, Robert E. Lee. He, um, he proposed him as being the great Southern gentleman uh, that he really was, and he became very, uh, Lee became very popular even up north uh, after the war due to this image that was created of him. 
And this became so prevalent that the little girl down south asked her mom, says, Mom, is Jubal early in the Old Testament or the New Testament? But we do have lots of uh, material written about him. He was an interesting character. Uh, Carl, um, Carl uh, um, this was written here after several years ago, um, but um, it, this would be the book that you'd probably, Charles Arsburn wrote that, that you'd want to pick up uh, that gives a good uh, record of him. Another favorite son, Booker T. Washington. We now have a national monument here in Franklin County due to Booker T. Washington. Um, and he was such a great orator, such a great educator. And uh, he was uh, young when he left here, nine years old. He was taken to West Virginia by his stepfather uh, and put to work in the coal mines there and he worked in the coal mines, and there he, he always wanted to learn to read and write. He would take uh, the Burroughs lady that he was raised on the Burroughs plantation here to school on horseback and pick her up, and he wanted to learn to read and write too. And so when he was working in the coal mines, he heard about Hampton Institute for Blacks uh, at Hampton. And so he figured there's a better way. So he literally walked most of the 200 miles to Hampton Institute, but he got there. Uh, they were very much impressed with him and how studious he was. He excelled there. And at age 25, he was given, uh, uh, this is the, the actual cabin that he was raised in here uh, in Franklin County. Uh, but he was given the head of Tuskegee Institute, and it was just a fledgling young college that hadn't been started. He had his students to build the structures there uh, and had hands-on um, implementation, but the student body in building the college made quite an institution, and he had friends uh, Andrew Carnegie was a friend. Um, Booker T. Washington made friends all around. And he did so much for blacks at that time, uh, really pushed education, had George Washington Par uh, Carver to come into the institute there, work with peanuts. And um, his philosophy was separate but equal has been criticized since then as being not forceful enough. However, it was post-Civil War, and at that time, he was confident of McKinley, of Taft, and Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt had him for dinner at the White House, the first time a black had ever had dinner at the White House. He was um, also, he had tea with Queen Elizabeth, uh, he uh, received the first black um, award from Harvard College. Um, he got an honorary degree from there. But he did so much and so much for the time, um, but he died in the early 1900s. Interestingly, uh, Booker T. Washington contributed to the Confederate statue here in Rocky Mount. Um, and he did so in commemoration of the um, sons of his master here, Burroughs. Uh, and they worked together and knew each other intimately, and he wanted to commemorate that. Another interesting place here that I bet you didn't know about, but uh, this is a John Hook plantation on Route 122 just before you get to Hales Ford Bridge. Now, the old house here was John Hook's 1784 house. Across the road over here was the uh, storehouse, part of the storehouse, that in 1850 was moved back across the road uh, to behind the house. And here, the slave quarters uh, attached on to that now. But um, 
1850, Mr. Llewellyn Powell owned the plantation here and had this work done. And his mulatto slave, or not actually, uh, uh, she, uh, she I think was a free lady, but uh, she lived here and Adam Clayton Powell Sr. was uh, born here and lived here until he was 15 when they moved to West Virginia. Adam Clayton Powell went to Yale University Divinity School, became a minister, became minister of the Absinia Baptist Church in Harlem, and this became the first mega church in America. 14,000, uh, congregation of 14,000 in Harlem. Well, he, in, 18, in 1908, he became um, the pastor of this church and was there for many years. He uh, was very big in human rights, uh, social equality, social justice, and uh, this very much impressed a young German scholar that was in theology school in New York. And so he came over, started going to the church, then started teaching Sunday school there. But he was so impressed with this minister from Franklin County, Virginia, that uh, he followed in his footsteps and then went back to Germany and uh, start preaching the same philosopher that he taught here. That person was none other than Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that you've probably heard about him in church. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the major theologians of the day. He went back, he opposed Adolf Hitler, and uh, he wrote uh, a great deal, and particularly the role of uh, Christians in a secular world and things of this nature. Uh, and he was hung by Adolf Hitler in uh, 1945, just before the end of the war. But here was a guy with, that is known worldwide that was majorly influenced by a person born and raised in Franklin County. Well, corn has been very important to Franklin Countyans for many, many years, and it has been of primary importance, so much so that way back um, when Old Chapel Church was built in 1769, uh, there was so much damage to the king's corn crop that in 1769 they specified that for Halifax and Bedford counties and surrounding counties here and Pennsylvania County, that uh, they had to um, put an attachment on to the tithes to the church. Now everybody had to pay tithes to the Church of England church, whether you were a Baptist or anything else. So what they did, they attached an addendum for each tithe, you had to bring in five squirrel scalps or five crow's heads in addition, and that was to be taken by the justice of the peace, and the justice of the peace would then destroy those so they couldn't be used the subsequent year. Well, Franklin Canyons have always known what to do with corn, and um, probably what you didn't know was the immense uh, operation of moonshining in Franklin County. Now this was so much so that in the early 1930s they sent in a group of federal investigators to see just what was going on here. And this was presented at a trial in 1935 that was the second longest trial in the history of Virginia. Aaron Burr's trial was number one, and this was number two. But what they did, the um, government showed evidence that there was um, uh, widespread moonshining, there was corruption from top to bottom, uh, the law enforcement uh, involved as well as everybody else, 
And so many of Franklin County's leading citizens, and certainly well, most wealthy citizens, were given prison time at that time. But uh, there was a lot of publicity in 1935 about what was going on, and Liberty Magazine had articles and which they referred to this county as being the um, wettest county in the nation. And in 1990, the Washington Post had a big article on basically the same thing in the Metro about how bad it was and it was still present. Well, in 1935, the government uh, pre presented evidence as to what was going on here in Franklin County. Richmond was eight times larger than Franklin County, but we used 35 times as much yeast as they did. Also, within a four-year period of time, we brought in 33 and a half million pounds of sugar. And um, they uh, estimated that some families used as much as 5,000 pounds of sugar per month. Well, you can interpret that any way that you want to. I always interpret it as we were the sweetest people on earth. But the government said that means three and a half million gallons of moonshine untaxed. So that's what happened, and that was the basis of the trial. But this was what was going on at the time. It didn't stop moonshining in Franklin County. In 1981, the state of Virginia cut up 150 stills. 74 of them were in Franklin County. I knew of a truck driver in uh, the mid-1980s and he brought in four and a half million pounds of sugar to the county and he said he was one of only three trucks operating. But uh, the pressure was on and people were looking at Franklin County and some of the still uh, moved out. And as recently as uh, this past week at the uh, Ferrum Festival, one of the, my old patients and the moonshiner told me that he moved down, his, he and his partner moved down to Henry County, uh, to Ridgeway, and they operated uh, for a little over a year and then broke up, and he said he made $78,000 on that. The hail steel in 1999, which was up in Craig County, but basically based in here, was producing moonshine at about the rate uh, that I figured of 100,000 gallons of that per year. But they were caught within eight months of operation. But at eight dollars and a quarter a gallon, this was pretty good profit. And so that tells you the motivation for doing this. And indeed, as is now claimed, Moonshine uh, is the, was a major project, uh, but not the only product in Franklin County. And uh, Moonshine Capital of the World seems to be the logo that has taken over. Well, it had deep roots from way, way back, and here you can see the dressed in their Sunday best, they're at the moonshine still to get their picture made. And here it shows that it was hard work indeed, uh, moving the still equipment, getting the sugar in, getting the product out, and doing so in a way that wouldn't be detected by the federal agents. And here, a 1915 still on Shooting Creek. Uh, with the banjo uh, showing the roots of bluegrass music and uh, the still and all the partners stationed there. Early on we tried to preserve this history and with the Blue Ridge Institute um, I recall seeing the article about this early moonshine still and so then I called Roddy Moore and said, we've got to get on this. And so we started working 
uh, we beat out the Smithsonian Institute and the National Park Institute, National Park, to get this for the Blue Ridge Institute. Here you see Reverend Goodpasture on the right, um, and Ken Stoneman, revenue officer in the middle, and then I'm on the left. Um, but uh, we had to go through unbelievable things not to uh, tear holes in the steel, but to keep it intact uh, for the purposes of display only. But that has been popularized at the Blue Ridge Festival um, and is a way of life, and that's what the Blue Ridge Farm Museum and Festival uh, does, is perpetuates our past history. People tried other things in Franklin County as well, some of which you probably don't know about. John Bahila made rifles, 1820 till about 1860. These were Kentucky-style rifles, and we, find, we found them out as far as the Midwest, uh, down in Missouri, and all around, and up the Valley of Virginia. These were typical Kentucky rifles, but made here in Franklin County. Also, uh, uh, on the Smith Plantation, uh, here was silk, silk thread made here in Franklin County. Uh, the Pesley family uh, were doing this in the, the um, 1830s. Uh, they were m uh, trying to make silk uh, with silkworms on mulberry trees. And the old Smith Plantation down behind Dudley School uh, still has mulberry trees down on the branch. Uh, and this came off the uh, Smith Plantation. Uh, to buy, uh, apple uh, was a big crop here in the 1920s, but it originated back before the Civil War. And the Grants were furnishing apples to General Lee's troops. But Algoma Orchard was a major stay here in the county. There were, uh, they won awards in Washington State, which we now recognize as supplying so much of the apples to the grocery stores there. But they won awards there. And they had about 200 acres in orchards. A hundred of those acres were in Albemarle Pippins, which was their famous apple. And they would send out 10,000 barrels, not bushels, but barrels of apples. And many years, almost all of it to England, and most of it to uh, Buckingham Palace, uh, because they used a great deal of it. And they got it from Algoma Orchards right here. The orchard was uh, unusual. They had some trees 100 years old that were still producing. And one tree produced 22 barrels of apples from one single tree. But we still have orchards persistent here, uh, but the real glory days was with Algoma Orchard. Here you can see the um, emblem that was impressed on the barrel top. Um, this is the stamp that was heated up and stamped on top. You see the AL uh, for Algoma. Well, bet you didn't know, but um, I mentioned Robert Hill uh, had a son that was killed by a mountain lion on Scufflin Hill. Bet you didn't know that we still have mountain lions here in Franklin County. So my partner um, here, um, Zeb Perry, and I were hunting this previous uh, spring. We were turkey hunting. He killed two turkeys. But at 6.30 in the morning, we were sitting in the blind calling turkeys when all of a sudden we heard this wow, And then four or five times we heard more calls each time coming closer to us. We knew what this was because over the past five years there had been numerous sightings of mountain lions in, within a mile area of where we were in Sontag. So we waited and then all of a sudden from to the side of our blind 
A full-grown mountain lion goes rushing down the hills into a clump of trees and rustled in the clump of trees. We sure got the turkey we were trying to call in, um, but we didn't go down and provide dessert for him. Um, but uh, this went right in front of Zeb sitting there uh, with only a double barrel shotgun um, and we were happy that he found the real turkey and not us that he started out looking for. But yes, they're there. The local game wardens will tell you that they've been extinct in, since in Virginia since 1887 uh, and that they're not here. But the sportsmen and the farmers have seen them on game cameras. They've seen them live. They are here. And Zeb will tell you that they're here. The face of Franklin County changed in the 1960s when the Stanton River was impounded at the pass in Smith Mountain. And Smith Mountain Lake was started. Uh, and this changed greatly the entire county. As soon as this started and the lake started filling up, and here you can see that the lake is uh, beginning to impound, and already building was starting, and it continued to accumulate here. And you wonder, how did all the people know about or get attracted to Smith Mountain Lake? Well. There are all kinds of theories. My theory is that young farm boys learned long ago that after a long morning of working out in crops, at noontime they would come home and dad and they would eat lunch and then dad would take a short siesta in the heat of the day before going back to work. And at that time, the farm boys would get together and go to the creek and um, had great fun skinny dipping in the creek and just enjoying the water. Well, it took a while for this to catch on up north, but they soon learned that it really was a lot of fun playing in and on the water. And so they started coming, and as they came, they told their friends, and they started coming, and it was a mushroom effect here. And then, of course, with all the people coming in, we had uh, to have accommodations for that. And so what uh, happened here was we had a local entrepreneur that was a uh, farm boy raised on a tobacco farm. He started building trade and then started proposing and to uh, send the message out about Smith Mountain Lake and then building for that. And you know, a magician can produce a rabbit right out of a hat, but Ron Willard did one better than that. He brought a town out of a cow pasture. Now that's a real magician, but he has been a magician for the lake. A local person who was a person, an entrepreneur, uh, that took advantage of the situation, an opportunity presented itself, and he capitalized on that. But we have people that have roots way back. Um, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson's Bain's family, I understand, was from down in the um, Figsboro area of Franklin County. Um, but we have lots of people that have deep roots here that have made a difference in America. And here at our Franklin County Bicentennial in 1986, we have John McBride. Now he's standing with a Virginia Conestoga wagon that uh, dates to the early 1800s. John McBride was pilot of the Challenger in 1984 and carried up Sally Ride uh, and the first seven-man crew. That's quite a difference in transportation that we're looking at. But John has his own version of changes in transportation. You see, his dad was raised here in Franklin County and drove a horse and buggy here in Franklin County. 
Um, down near the old Bethel Church, you'll see the McBride big tombstone out in front. And the McBride and Purdue family is all his family. But he um, then moved to West Virginia and lived where John was born and raised. And then in 1984, his dad went down to see his son go off as pilot of the Challenger into space. Quite a change in one generation from horse and buggy of Franklin County to pilot of a space uh, vessel in 1984. But John enjoyed his time here. He um, gave us, he uh, stayed with us for um, about three days uh, during this time. And he sent me this. This is the patch that he designed for that mission. And this Virginia flag, he carried both of those into space on the Challenger. And he gave us this, and you can't read this here, but it said that he was well rooted in Franklin County. And this is true. Another person that is rooted in Franklin County and that we're proud of is Burt Thompson. Burt Thompson moved here from North Carolina when he was a young fellow. He went to school here. He lived, he had a single parent mom and he lived uh, across the street from where we did on South Main Street. And uh, he and his brother helped me quite a bit uh, and I came to know them very good. He graduated in 1980 from Franklin County High School and wasn't going to college. So I carried him to Ferrum College one morning ta and talked to Dr. Hart, told him the situation. Um, and so he told Dr. Hart, you give me a chance, I'll make you proud. Well, Dr. Hart gave him a place. He started out, got in ROTC, got an ROTC scholarship, went on to two years at uh, Norwich Military Academy, graduated from there, um, and had an illustrious, uh, uh, illustrious career in the Army. Um, he graduated and he um, retired four years ago as a Brigadier General with three master's degree. Um, here you can see he is at the uh, Memorial Day services here in Franklin County where he gave the address and at the same place where as a boy he was fishing in Pig River uh, when he was a young boy. He um, received uh, a um, uh, key to the town of Rocky Mount. Uh, he is a distinguished alumnus of Ferrum College, um, and he has given the graduation address at the 100th anniversary of Ferrum College. So he um, has many honors from here locally. He had an illustrious career. He uh, was called to the Pentagon in 1991 after Desert Storm and was given the Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award for, uh, for being the outstanding uh, company commander uh, for the war. And his name is on the plaque by the Douglas MacArthur uh, memorabilia as well as the Douglas MacArthur wing of the Pentagon. He was deputy director for the U.S. Military Command Center at the Pentagon, uh, and that's the most important office. All the information of the world goes into that. Every order for every branch of the military comes out of that. And so this is um, a prime important uh, office at the lowest level of the Pentagon and the most protected one. At the time, his job was to assimilate the material and he briefed the Secretary of Defense Panetta four to, uh, three to four times a week on world affairs, what satellites was going over, what military changes were at places, the political situation in um, every little country you've ever heard of. Uh, and all this 
was uh, put together and briefed uh, to the Secretary of Defense. At that time, he had a key to the nuclear code. Uh, he then served as the uh, Chief Executive Officer for the, for the um, Deputy um, Secretary of the Army. Um, and he's had multiple, multiple careers. Here you can see we're at the Memorial Day services and uh, I'm very, very proud of him. He still calls me dad. Here he's uh, out behind the house uh, and sharing life's experiences with um, Zeb Perry. Here, the big oak tree you see just behind him here is the big oak tree. You see he and his brother helped me tear down a structure in um, Callaway in order to get this log cabin out. And so we dismantled that, piled the logs right where this tree is, an acorn fell out of one of the logs, and this oak tree grew up. So that tells you something about uh, the 40 years ago uh, when he was helping me uh, to build this uh, log cabin. Well, bet you did know that Franklin County is a great place to live. With the natural beauty we have from the mountains to the lake, the rural nature we have, the friendly people here. Uh, you know, they're going to throw their hand up uh, at you whether they know you or not. And if you're going to get in the traffic, it's not going to be long till somebody's going to stop and let you in. That's the people of Franklin County. And that's the land we love for those many, many reasons. But Franklin County is a Christian community. We have uh, churches on every corner. Unfortunately, we don't fill them up. Uh, we're told there's only one out of every four people in Franklin County that actually attend church. But we have these, and many churches, such as Franklin Heights Church here, uh, they try to serve the community. They have a program known as Love Franklin County. And they serve the county by serving the hungry, the needy, and they serve the community by trying to get people to enjoy themselves, to mix together by sponsoring the Strawberry Festival and things like that, support of Christmas Parade and, and the Christmas festivities here in the county. So this is all an outreach of the program, not only outreaching to share the gospel with anybody and everybody and to uh, there are three locations that Cross Point at, at um, Burnt Chimney and Union Hall and Rocky Mount, but also reaching out to the world uh, with mission uh, churches in uh, Boston and in Iceland and mission trips to other land, to uh, Africa and other places. So yes, we're reaching out and we're expanding above Franklin County, but we love Franklin County and we love to promote Franklin County. Yes, this is a place that hadn't forgot its history and this is Franklin County History Museum and Franklin County History Headquarters on South Main Street. And here you see we pay tribute to the Crooked Road, the musical traditions of this county, the museum that we have. Also, the Blue Ridge Institute that is doing much here. The governor of Virginia is meeting um, with Roddy Moore and others proclaiming this to be the Folk Life Center of Virginia, uh, preserving the history and the heritage that we all enjoy. There are places and people that are writing about us. And here, Ann Smart Martin in Michigan wrote about buying into the world of goods. I mentioned the John Hook store. This is about John Hook store here in Franklin County. What people were buying at that store, what people were using, uh, and an interesting book uh, about our locality. Yes, we do celebrate the history, and here, our bicentennial, we had a year-long period of festivities, of activities, and the bicentennial ball. 
And then culminating that was the history of Franklin County, which we had published. This is the official history by John and Emily Salmon, an outstanding book that um, has been proclaimed as a winning book and has been um, the, his, the um, librarian at University of Virginia speaking to a black audience in uh, Richmond and he himself being a black carried this book and told them that this should be the role model for future county histories in Virginia because of its equivocal treatment uh, of blacks and whites. But it is a prize-winning book. As you can see, Franklin County's two most famous uh, sons, Booker T. Washington and Jubal Early, with the painting of a justice in the center. This was painted for the, 19, uh, the 1830 courthouse in Franklin County and hangs over the judge's chamber in the courthouse today. Yes, we pay tribute to our veterans and honor our veterans with a wonderful memorial here. But it's a county also looking ahead to the future with the Katsis Center, a technology center that, um, that uh, teaches in addition to the traditional education, uh, new and advanced techniques and things that the students of tomorrow are going to need. And then further education with Ferrum College. So it is a place educating for the future. It's a place that we're preparing for the future. We are preparing with the new summit places for advanced uh, industry, better paying jobs, and integrated with that is recreation so that while people are working at lunch break, they can take a stroll through the Greenway or they can do things here. They can, take, uh, they can come back for recreational activities at the same places they're working. And this is to integrate in order to have a enjoyable occupation and an enjoyable life here in Franklin County. That's what it's all about. It's a great place to raise kids uh, and a great place for families and even a great place to retire. And here, Don Riggs, uh, and Don Riggs is a gentleman that um, was a Navy pilot. He flew 97 missions over Hanoi, bombing missions, without getting shot down. He was a naval commander. He um, was a guy that actually I mentioned John McBride. He was a guy that spotted him as a young flyer as being exceptional, and he followed him and then pushed him into getting his master's degree. From that, uh, he went into um, the Air Force as an experimental uh, test pilot, and from that to an astronaut. This is the man that, uh, that got him going. And interestingly, after retiring in Northern Virginia, and he, his hobby was woodworking, and he had a woodworking friend here in Franklin County, he visited, he liked Franklin County, he moved back here, and has had a wonderful future here, a wonderful retirement of gardening and woodworking, and here you can see he has made a turkey collar for Zeb, and he uh, receives the appreciation from this young fellow in a manner that money couldn't buy. But it is a great place for retirement, and many, particularly on the lake and, and places, have enjoyed this. So the road is wide open. This is the Carolina Road of 275 years ago that brought people into the county. Where this road leads, nobody knows. But our future generation will determine that. And our future generation will bring changes and opportunity and blessings that we have never known. 
Franklin County's greatest generation is yet to be seen. So we're preparing for the future with our young people and with a, our preparation, with education and so forth, whatever it takes to make this a greater Franklin County than it's ever been. In God we trust that God will provide for us a bright, bright future. And I want to say I want to thank each and every one of the people that uh, are listening to this. We thank you for being a part of the history of Franklin County, but even more so for being one of the people that's going to determine what our future of Franklin County really is. God bless you.